Hey, what's up, everybody? And welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 297. I am Kendall, your host. <laughs> and is... I am your host, Josh. <laughs> yep, we are joined by our producer, Janelle. Hello, everyone. So, guys, today we have a really wild one for you. Uh, many of you have probably heard of Jane Goodall, but how many of you out there have heard of Diane Fossey? Probably not many. Not many, but... I mean, maybe our older audience would recognize Whoa, her name, Whoa, careful who you call older here. I'm just saying our more mature, if you were born more educated, in, more uh, experienced. Yeah. Maybe if you were born in the 70s, 80s. Maybe. You yeah. might have heard of her. Well, even like 90s too. Yeah, I guess say 90s. Yeah. I mean, even most recently because yeah. Ellen DeGeneres, I mean, DeGeneres. Of course I like you. You knew I liked you. You've been on the show many times, and and don't I show like? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She started. Did you say degenerate? Sorry, it just kind of slipped off the tongue there. Understandable. Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> yes. Was very generous mm -hmm. in creating the Gorilla Fund. Because mm -hmm. that's what Diane Fossey dedicated her life to, studying the mountain gorillas mm -hmm. in Africa. And... That's, you know, I remember watching that episode. Oh, yeah, I do, too. That was a big deal. Where she announced her, her center Well, that wasn't she, she, like, gifted it? I remembered her wife came on and was, like, gave it to her as a gift, the Ellen did Yeah, thing. but I think it was Ellen's money, too. Uh, yeah. I think they both. Oh, for sure. It was Ellen money, for sure. Yeah. Well, it's literally called the Ellen Campus. Of the Diane Fossey. Gorilla Fund. Right. Yes. Yes, it was a... Uh, present from her wife Portia for mm -hmm. her 60th birthday. Yep. Yep. So she's kind of carrying on the legacy of Diane Fossey. There's a whole like exhibit there going over a lot of the things um, that we're going to go over today, although we're going to go in much greater detail. Yes. Specifically around Diane's mysterious and very, very brutal murder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a still, this is still unsolved. Yeah. This, this murder to this day probably will be one that remains unsolved unfortunately. unfortunately yeah yeah but there's a lot of this one will maybe kind of leave you a little conflicted about diane because for sure. we feel that way she did a lot of good for mm -hmm. the gorilla species mm -hmm. but she did a whole lot of bad oh man she was oh yeah she gave zero fucks by the end that's for sure yeah that's a good way to put it mm -hmm. i mean very very spicy um, a lot of whiskey involved mm -hmm. and just isolation, yeah. I, I think, is a big one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Living often by herself with gorillas. Yeah. But some of the things that she was willing to do for the gorillas, it got, yeah. it got pretty crazy. And I, yeah, I think people will be kind of split on whether they think Diane is a hero or yeah. a villain. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I think we have to just get into it before we really get discussing, you know? Yep. But yeah, she dedicated nearly 20 years to the study of Rwanda's critically endangered mountain gorillas high up in the Virunga mountain range. And without Diane, we wouldn't know the habits of these animals, their social structures, and the efforts necessary to save the species. And yeah. she actually did have a massive impact. Yeah, she really put the the species on the map and... Mm -hmm. created a lot of awareness like around when it comes to awareness. Yeah. yeah and and poaching is obviously a major issue when it comes to especially these types of animals and if they if it's left unchecked and the general public isn't aware of what's happening then it's very easy for these species to go completely extinct which nobody wants i think i think most people don't want to see a species go extinct i would Whether, hope everyone yes right mm -hmm. i mean you know, in a lot of these areas, you know, some of these endangered animals are, you know, obviously killed for poaching, but sometimes they're killed for other reasons as well, just food and, and things like that. So it's, yeah, it can a be a tough very... tough topic, very controversial. Definitely. We'll get into a lot of um, discussion today. But, but let's uh, take you all the way back to the very mm -hmm. beginning. Mm-hmm. Of Miss Diane Fossey. Yes, 1932, January 16th, when Diane was born in San Francisco to Hazel Kidd and George Edward Fossey III. 
Her mother, Hazel, was a fashion model, and George was a real estate agent and business owner, and the family was quite affluent. And while Diane spent her early years in comfort, her parents' relationship was unfortunately failing. George was a heavy drinker and was often involved with the law after drunk driving or public intoxication. And George's behavior just became too much for Hazel to bear over time, and they divorced when Diane was only six. Now, Diane stayed with her mother, but George tried to keep in contact with the family. But Hazel wouldn't allow that, and George would end up only seeing Diane a few times as she was growing up. And in the year following their divorce, Hazel got remarried. She married a businessman named Richard Price, who was even wealthier. And the family began to adhere to his strict traditionalist values. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Richard was awful to Diane. He never viewed Diane as his child. She wasn't allowed to sit at the family dining table while they ate. Can't even imagine that. And he offered her absolutely no emotional support. Her mother loved Richard and treated Diane as he did. Diane was very self-conscious as a child. She was reserved and resented her family life and always felt like an outcast due to her physical appearance. Although she was pretty, she was six foot tall, and that always made her feel awkward. Um, She never made many friends, and this is when her love for animals really began. Diane always preferred the company of animals to humans, which is relatable. But she described animals as always upfront about their emotions and what they wanted from you. They trusted her when they wanted her attention and shied away when they weren't ready. And as a way to cope with her parents' divorce, Diane began horseback riding at the age of six, and she loved being around horses. She even earned a letter on the riding team by graduation. But her stepdad, Richard, wouldn't allow her to bring any animals into their home. At one point, he did let her get a goldfish, but once it died, he never allowed her to have another one. Once Diane graduated high school, Richard urged her to enroll in a business course at the College of Marin in San Francisco, and she agreed, although she wasn't inspired by this, and she definitely didn't feel like business was her calling. So when Diane was 19, she was offered to work on a ranch in Montana during her summer vacation. And here, she really fell in love with animals again and always wanted to be around them. Although Diane contracted chicken pox and had to end her stay early, Her mind was changed. She had to spend her life with animals, and she knew that now. When Diane returned home, she informed her mother and stepfather that she would drop out of business school and enroll in a pre-veterinary course at the University of California, Davis. And this enraged her stepfather, who said that she would be cut off financially if she went through with it, which is really hard to imagine telling your parents that you want to become a vet and then being that mad. My parents would have been very impressed, but anyway. Diane could not imagine life without animals and decided that it was worth it. So in 1950, Diane went back to school to become a vet. She supported herself by working as a clerk, completing lab work, and laboring as a factory machinist. While Diane was a good student who excelled in biology, she was struggling with the hard sciences such as chemistry and physics. And unfortunately, Diane did fail out of school during her second year. However, Diane still wanted to work as someone who helped others, and in 1952, she transferred to the San Jose State College, where she studied occupational therapy for children. And after she graduated in 1954, she interned at various hospitals throughout California. She mainly worked with children who suffered from tuberculosis. And while she felt rewarded by this work, she wanted to get as far away from California as possible. So she became the director of occupational therapy at the Cosair Children's Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky, and became well known for her work with children. She lived in a cottage on Glen Mary Farm where she rode horses and helped with vet services. And that run down college lifestyle soon became Diane's preferred way of life. But even with her life well put together, Diane still wanted to get closer to animals and see them in their natural habitat. She wished more than anything to visit the national parks in Africa and finally get close to them. Soon, Diane became close with Mary White Henry, the secretary to the chief administrator at the Children's Hospital. Mary was entrenched in the social scene within Louisville and introduced Diane to many new friends and potential suitors. Diane became romantically involved with Franz Forrester, a wealthy Rhodesian businessman. And while the two were sporadically involved throughout their lives, he was always more interested in Diane than she was in him. If you don't know about Rhodesia, it was a short-lived and unrecognized state in Africa ruled by white European and American business people. 
It ultimately failed in 1979 and became what is now known as Zimbabwe. While Diane was not seriously interested in Franz, she was interested in his ties to the African continent. While seeing Franz, Diane was also romantically involved with Irish priest Father Raymond. While their relationship couldn't become more than an affair, it was through him that she unknowingly converted to Catholicism. This mode of infidelity and refusing to settle down would be the blueprint for Diane's relationships moving forward. In 1957, Franz proposed to Diane and offered to pay for her to live in Rhodesia with his family. Diane said no, as it wasn't Rhodesia that she wanted to experience, but the wild animals living in Congo's Virunga National Park. Although Franz and Mary had offered Diane to go to Africa with them, she wanted to visit on her own terms. She couldn't afford the trip, though, so she studied where she could go and who she could hire to show her around all the various parks and wildlife reserves. She decided that she would visit Africa by 1963, no matter what. So she ended up hiring British hunter John Alexander a year in advance to be her guide. She even took out her life savings, a bank loan, and mortgaged her income in order to cover the trip. She was literally willing to put up and give up everything to see the wild animals. Before her trip, she read the book The Year of the Gorilla by primatologist George Schaller, which first inspired her love for the critically endangered mountain gorillas. Now, these are some incredible animals. I mean, I think it'd be so cool to go out and see them living in the wild and I mean, obviously, they're extremely powerful and oh, yeah. strong. They're estimated to be like 10 times their body weight and strength. And I think most people know this, but I always find it so interesting that we share about 98% of the same DNA with them. Yeah, that is super cool. Distant relatives. Yeah. But it's actually weird because I was looking up yesterday. This is kind of a tangent. I was looking up what do we share with like dogs and whatever else we yeah. share like 80 some percent with dogs we share like 70 oh, really? percent with bananas like <laughs> oh, wow so maybe it's not that impressive so, that we're so close to gorillas <laughs> i mean 98 percent. that's yeah obviously like pretty close very but close we're 70 percent with bananas <laughs> interesting well we're all connected <laughs> that is a fun so fact. it makes sense diane embarked on her trip just when she said she would in 1963 the hunter john alexander took her on excursions through kenya tanzania congo and Zimbabwe. While in Congo, Diane visited George Schaller's research camp on Mount McKenna. This was when she first discussed the importance of mountain gorillas and she could feel herself becoming obsessed. She said this about the experience, quote, I believe it was at this time the seed was planted in my head, even if unconsciously, that I would return to Africa to study the gorillas of the mountains. One of the last places Diane would visit proved to be the most important. She met archaeologist Louis Leakey while he researched a newly excavated dig at Olduvai Gorge. Louis Leakey was world famous as he studied humankind's origins and spearheaded many ecological research projects. While she visited with Leakey, he told her about Jane Goodall's work with chimpanzees in Tanzania. Jane Goodall is famous now, of course, but at this point her research was only in its third year. Jane Goodall's story was a particularly inspiring one to Diane. Though well-educated, Jane was relatively inexperienced with field studies of wild animals. She had been Leakey's secretary for many years before he arranged for a National Geographic grant for her to study the great chimpanzees. Leakey entrusted Jane for a few reasons. He believed that women were naturally better observers, more patient, more tuned to the needs of non-verbal creatures. True that, That's though. fact. Mm-hmm. You better know. He also preferred relative inexperience when a person was highly passionate, as they wouldn't let other studies get in their way. But there's also this. Leakey was also probably a huge creep. Maybe that's why he preferred women. Mm -hmm. His professional relationship with Jane would be described as sexual harassment by today's standards. She put down his advances and watched as Leakey's wife, Mary, drank heavily to numb herself from her husband's actions. But as Jane endured, Leakey rewarded her with access to new dig sites, a chance to study artifacts independently and eventually granted her to study the chimpanzees. Leakey did believe that a long-term study of the great apes was essential to understand the origins of humankind. While it is unknown if Leakey also put Diane through the same harassment, he did take a keen interest in the young woman who had sold everything just to see the wild animals across the world. Leakey took Diane to some newly excavated sites within the gorge. Diane, who is still relatively awkward and clumsy, slipped down a slope and broke her ankle. This cut her visit with Leakey short and threatened the last part of her tour, the Virunga Mountains in Congo. 
you're not familiar with the Virunga Mountains, there are a vast range of ancient volcanoes that borders the Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda. The area is one of two mountain ranges on the planet that is home to the Great Mountain Gorilla. It is also an essential area for the locals as many cross the range to another country if a crisis is occurring in their own. The populated regions beneath the mountains were mainly impoverished as many residents had to pick up everything and relocate to avoid death. With a broken ankle, Diane climbed the Virunga Mountains on the Congolese side to meet with Joan and Alan Root, who are wildlife photographers making a documentary about the mountain gorillas. Diane camped behind their cabin in the mountains for several days before they took her into the forest to search for the gorillas. When Diane finally saw and photographed the gorillas for the first time, she said this. It was their individuality combined with the shyness of their behavior that remained the most captivating impression of this first encounter with the greatest of the great apes. I left with reluctance, but with never a doubt that I would somehow return to learn more about the gorillas of the misted mountains. So there was a time a few years back where I just completely stopped going to the doctor. I had so many bad experiences. I was chronically ill and no doctors were taking me seriously. But what I was really missing was the right doctor. And now I do see the doctor because I have found some great medical professionals through ZocDoc. Now, we actually started using ZocDoc before they started sponsoring any of our shows. Josh just randomly found it years ago, and we had such a great experience with it that we started recommending it to our friends and family as well. Now, if you've never heard about ZocDoc, it's a place where you can find and book doctors who will make you feel comfortable and actually listen to you. And it's so easy to do. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. Once you find the doc you want, you can book them immediately. No more awkwardly waiting on hold with a receptionist. And all of these docs have verified reviews from actual real patients, which that is really the game changer. And we're talking about booking appointments with tens of thousands of top rated patient reviewed credible doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance, are located near you and treat basically any condition that you're searching for. And the typical wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is just between 24 and 72 hours. That's it. Sometimes you can even score same day appointments. So what are you waiting for, friends? Check it out. Go to ZocDoc.com slash mile higher and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc.com slash mile higher. Once again, ZocDoc.com slash mile higher. So Diane returned home and continued her work at Cosair in Kentucky. She also published articles about her trip, gave lectures, during which she presented her photos of the gorillas to the public. Three years later, in 1966, Louis Leakey conducted a lecture tour across the United States. After he spoke in Kentucky, Diane waited in line with a crowd to reintroduce herself. When she spoke to him, she presented the articles and photos that she had published about mountain gorillas in Congo. Leakey was impressed, and he talked to her about potentially leading a long term research study of the gorillas. And Diane, of course, was incredibly excited and wanted to do anything to make that a reality. Leakey informed her that she would have to get her appendix removed before this trip. Now, we have no idea why he told her this, and it was clearly a lie. And like we said, Leakey was definitely, he was a weirdo. And he simply wanted to test her dedication, is what we've kind of gathered. Of course, Diane did inform him a few weeks later that she had her appendix removed and was ready to go whenever. It took eight months for Leakey to secure the funding from National Geographic for Diane's study, and during this time, she finally finished paying off her loan and began to teach herself Swahili, which it doesn't seem like she actually fully learned. She also studied George Schaller's work closely, and though Diane understood how to care for animals, she had no framework for actually studying them in the wild. Schaller's study was the only Western study on the mountain gorillas, so her methodology had to be created as she went along. Leakey sent Jane Goodall and Diane to study the great apes and recruited Birute Galdikas to study the orangutans of Borneo. The three women would be known as the Trimates, or Leakey's Angels. I don't know if it's just me, but I think any, any group of women that start getting a name... Yeah, it's As, like Rael. Like almost, yeah. Rael's angels. Very Rael. Yep. Yeah, very cool. Big cult. red flags. Very culty. Big red flags. But anyway, in December of 1966, Diane left her life in Kentucky behind and flew to Nairobi, Kenya, 
And there she stocked up on food and equipment before taking a canvas-topped Land Rover named Lily to visit Jane Goodall. And while Jane's work did inspire her, she was surprised by her method because Jane used human food to incentivize the chimpanzees to interact with them. And Diane felt that that was wrong because she was interfering too much with their natural habitat to achieve an objective observation. And of course, which we will get into more later, Diane's methods would soon become even more extreme than that. Alan Root, the wildlife photographer that Diane had met on her first trip to the continent, guided her from Kenya to Congo and helped her receive the permits necessary for her studies. He took her to the Kabara Meadow, where he had previously set up camp and taught her how to track the gorillas. Root left after only a few days, and Diane felt utterly alone before long. She was a heavy smoker, and she took to smoking two packs of local cigarettes a day. She also drank, too, but at this point, that hadn't really become as big of a problem as it will later down the the road. The gorillas would become her only focus, and even the camp soon fell into despair. On her first solo trek, Diane encountered a single male gorilla who was just chilling out, sunning himself in the meadow, and the gorilla was a little startled, as you can imagine, as she approached and he ran into the forest. But Diane felt like she could truly do this work, and a few weeks later, Stan Wekway, who was a local gorilla tracker, who had actually assisted the Roots during their expedition, joined Diane. And life and the study improved as Diane finally had an experienced tracker on her team. Her 7 by 10 foot tent was her bedroom, bath, and office. And though she attempted to wash her clothes, it was useless because they were in the rainforest. It's very damp and ensures that everything just stays wet. But with San Wekwe, there was someone who could properly look after the camp. And though Diane would treat her local staff much harsher in the future, she did respect San Wekwe and saw him as an irreplaceable teacher. Though the gorillas still scattered when she came into their view, she slowly got closer and closer. She matched their movements and vocalizations and began to recognize individual gorillas. And this is really, really cool. She would actually sketch their faces and identify the gorillas by their nose prints. I had no idea, but every gorilla has a different pattern of wrinkles across their nose, and that's how you can tell them apart. And San Wekwe actually taught her that method. She said this of her time in the Kabara Valley, quote, The Kabara groups taught me much regarding gorilla behavior. From them, I learned to accept the animals on their own terms and never push them beyond the varying levels of tolerance they were willing to give. Any observer is an intruder in the domain of a wild animal and must remember that the rights of an animal supersede human interests. Now, while that sounds pretty innocent, The level to which she put animals above humans would eventually prove to be very problematic. Diane believed that her entire research project would occur within the Kabara Meadow, just as her research developed, the political situation in the Congo worsened. This is because a rebellion had broken out in the Kivu province. And on July 9th, 1967, armed guards arrested Diane and Senwekwe outside her camp. They kept the 200 military guard for two weeks. Diane has described this time differently. At times, she said the guards tortured her, and other times, she said she was raped. Regardless of what happened during this time, there was a distinct shift in how Diane viewed the locals surrounding the parks where she studied. She would call her staff slurs, terrorize those who lived on the park's property, and believe that while the locals could track the gorillas, they had no business studying them. While captured, Diane developed a plan. She told the guards she would give them all of her available cash if they took her to Uganda to register her vehicle properly. The guards ended up agreeing and took her across the border. But once in Uganda, Diane immediately went to the Traveler's Rest Hotel and informed the staff that Congolese soldiers were with her. The Ugandan military was dispatched and the soldiers were arrested. The soldiers tricked by Diane always felt embarrassed by this turn of events and some believe they even met again. Ugandan and Rwandan officials warned Diane not to return to Congo. After that, she flew to Nairobi, where she met with Louis Leakey for the first time in seven months. They discussed what had happened, and despite warnings from the U.S. Embassy, Diane was to return to her research on the Rwandan side of the Rungo Mountains. Once in Rwanda, Diane met Rosamund Carr, a European woman who had lived there for many years. Rosamund would become Diane's only true friend. Rosamund introduced Diane to a Belgian woman named Aliette de Monk. Aliette had lived in Congo most of her life, but like many others, she was forced to relocate to Rwanda following the Civil War. 
Aliette took Diane across the mountains to find a spot to set up camp and begin her research again. After two weeks, they found an alpine meadow along Mount Karasimbe. On September 24, 1967, Diane created the Karasoki Research Center in this meadow, and Kari came from the first four letters of Mount Karasimbe to the south, and Soki from the last four letters of Mount Basoki to the north. At this time, Diane also wrote this. Little did I know that by setting up two small tents in the wilderness of the Virungas, I had launched the beginnings of what was to become an internationally renowned research station eventually to be utilized by students and scientists from many countries. Once Aliette left Diane alone at the newly created Karasoki Research Center, she felt that same loneliness start to creep back in. She wanted Karasoki to become her home and didn't want it to fall into disrepair like the Kabara Meadow Camp. So she hired a much larger staff of the Rwandan locals from the Ruangari district below the mountains. While she spoke a little Swahili at this point, most of her workers spoke only Kenya Rwanda, and interpretation became her biggest challenge. So they began speaking through hand gestures and actions, and over the years, her Rwandan team of trackers eventually understood her English, which became critical as they started understanding her outbursts. Diane was described as, quote, the boss you wouldn't want by students and other workers. While she paid them a much higher wage than the park guards employed by the government, the day-to-day treatment they endured was awful. She would scream things at workers if things weren't done exactly to her standards, and she just regularly fired employees on a whim. So when she'd do this, the worker would leave the camp, walk three hours down the mountain to return home, and return only a few days later when Diane had changed her mind. While her workers also taught Diane how to track the gorillas, she wouldn't allow them to study the animals or get too close to them as she not only believed that the Rwandans were less intelligent, but she couldn't trust any of them not to be involved in poaching. Poaching was common within the Virunga National Park, but Diane severely overblew it to justify her extreme measures to prevent it. Only 200 mountain gorillas were left in the park when Diane arrived in Virunga. Though the park was the oldest in Rwanda, the fact that it bordered three other countries meant that it was often protected differently in each place. On the Congo side, much of that land was given to foreign mining companies. Damn those mining companies, destroying the environment, pushing the poor gorillas further up the mountain, which sadly resulted in a lot of gorillas losing their lives. This practice also displaced the people living just outside the park. Many relied on the agriculture and subsistence farming to survive, and without sustainable land outside the park, many were forced to have their livestock graze within its boundaries, which killed the vegetation. Many people, especially on the Rwandan side, had lost all of their livestock due to the various conflicts that force them to move to a new place. And after this, there's just no way to sustain yourself. Now, the Rwandan government park guards were also local and severely underpaid, and they knew many poachers and would allow them to hunt in the park if they paid them off. The poachers mostly hunted for bushmeat. They would set up traps for antelope that would, you know, fall into and then be eaten by the poachers. But occasionally, gorillas actually were captured in these traps. And before we move on any further into this episode, I do want to give a trigger warning to, you know, our animal lovers out there. Uh, It's important stuff to learn about, but it can be upsetting. So I just want to let you know, we are going to be talking about some very sad events that happened to some of these animals. But like I was saying, occasionally gorillas would be captured by these traps and they would usually be able to break free, but they would die due to infection later on. But if the gorilla did die and the poachers had access to the body, they would gather whatever meat they could from the body and then they would sell the hands, feet, and heads as ashtrays and decorations to Western tourists for as little as 20 bucks, which really blew my mind. I don't know why you would want like a gorilla hand ashtray. It's so bizarre. Um, But Diane also claimed that the gorilla poaching was essential to Rwandan society as they would use the animal's testicles and tongues in black magic rituals and talismans called sumu. In reality, though, this too was overblown. While the Rwandan religious practices were certainly misunderstood by the Westerners who worked in these locations, they would not actively hunt gorillas just to harvest their parts for rituals. Diane used her false understanding of Rwandan society to justify her extreme measures. She said that they were savages, which is untrue, but she herself began to act like one. Diane actually wore a Halloween mask, which looked really fucking scary, and she would stalk poachers, hoping to conjure the image of a witch who had cursed them. 
So Diane was fully unhinged at this point, wearing her Halloween mask around, and she killed or set free the different livestock that grazed on the park grounds, vandalized or set fire to the homes of people that she accused of poaching, and even kidnapped the child of a local who she believed had killed a silverback gorilla for Sumu. If her trackers captured a poacher, they were ordered to turn them over to the Rwandan government guards, but first they were brought to Diane to be tortured. Diane bound them, stripped them naked, and whipped their genitals with stinging nettles while she performed what she thought to be black magic rituals. And while Diane claimed the witch act was only for show, others think that she really believed in all of this more than the locals even did. If a Western student or worker wronged her, she collected locks of their hair and saved them in her cabin. And no one knows to this day exactly what she would do with them. Those who worked with Diane said that she took pleasure in torturing the poachers and even looked forward to humiliating them. Again, most of these poachers, if they were even poaching, were hunting animals to feed their families. I mean, they were in extreme situations. And in reality, the majority of poachers who targeted gorillas did it on behalf of the corrupt Rwandan officials like Mr. Z, the leader of the Ruangari province and brother-in-law to the president of Rwanda, who would become one of Diane's fiercest enemies. In these cases, the officials were uninterested in dead gorillas and were looking for orphaned gorilla babies to sell off to foreign zoos. And I had letters from her saying how terrible it was and how determined she was to stop the poachers. She was really heartbroken. This first came to Diane's attention in 1968 when Rwandan guards brought orphaned gorillas to Diane's cabin. The two siblings would be sold off to a zoo in Cologne, Germany, and they had fallen ill since they had lost their mother, and the Rwandan authorities wanted Diane to nurse them back to health. Diane named the two of them Coco and Pucker, and they immediately fell in love with her. While she had yet to get close to the gorillas in the wild, these two accepted her as their mother. They lived in her newly constructed iron cabin, crawled all over her, played with her dog Cindy, totally became part, you know, a big part of her life. And in 1968, National Geographic dispatched photographer Bob Campbell to photograph Diane for the magazine. Bob and his wife, Heather Martin, lived in Nairobi and were friends with the Leakeys. Bob photographed archaeological sites that Lewis and his son Richard had excavated, but was utterly inexperienced in wildlife photography. The Leakeys only sent him to Diane on recommendation after the original photographer, Alan Root, was bitten by a puff adder snake and lost his finger. So pretty rough. But when Bob arrived, Diane despised him. She thought he was untrustworthy and inexperienced, which is a little odd considering her lack of wildlife experience before Karasoki. She wrote in her journal after meeting Bob, quote, Bob Campbell is cocky as hell. He's honestly the biggest bore I have ever met. And for many years, Diane forced Bob to sleep in a constantly damp tent on the outskirts of the camp. Like her trackers, she didn't want Bob near the gorillas. Diane could still not get close to the gorillas yet herself. And Bob, who needed to shoot something for National Geographic, suggested they take Coco and Pucker out to play with her dog. Diane reluctantly agreed as she wanted the photos and footage to be that of wild gorillas. But still, the two of them went out. Photos of Coco and Pucker playing with Diane graced the cover of the January 1970 issue of National Geographic and made Diane an instant celebrity. She was now known as the Gorilla Lady. Coco and Pucker were soon taken by the Rwandan authorities and sold to the Cologne Zoo. And according to Bob, they died nine years later. But still, the National Geographic boom gave Diane the boost she needed, and finally she began to trust Bob. Bob was now not only Diane's photographer, but also her research partner. He studied the gorillas with Diane and created the methods alongside her. They took to knuckle walking, munching loudly on celery, and matching their vocalizations. So yeah, even on uh, late night shows when Diane would be interviewed, she would uh, do some of those. I wish we could play some of that, but it's all copyrighted, of course. She'd make some crazy sounds. I know. Like, rrr, 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 rrr. Wow. Stuff like that. Really. Mm, that was honestly good. not bad. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Un Been practicing. New talent unlocked. Yep. The goal is to make the gorillas curious about these humans and unthreatened. When the gorillas began to approach, they would hand them notebooks, gloves, and even bars of chocolate. 
While Diane didn't like Jane Goodall's methods of giving the gorillas food, she couldn't deny that they worked. Finally, after many years in Karasoki, the gorillas became custom to Diane. She focused on four distinct groups who had come to know her and soon picked her favorites. Bob had returned home to his wife in 1970, but returned to Karasoki in March of 1971. Due to Diane's treatment of the locals, poaching was on the rise because they're all pissed off at Diane. And Bob photographed the mutilated remains of gorillas. These gorillas still had their hands, heads, and feet, which indicated that they weren't killed for bushmeat or sale, but rather just for straight-up revenge against Diane. Bob tried to explain to her that this was a way of life for the locals, and Diane had intruded on it. Maybe they'd stop if she could make the locals care about the gorillas as much as she did, or incentivize them, in order to prevent poaching from going on further. Diane wouldn't hear it, though. She believed that the only way was through cruel, hard punishment. Diane would write in her journal, quote, I had fun today frightening the illegals with my Halloween mask. Diane confiscated machetes and traps from captured poachers and would display them proudly in her cabin. She also began using National Geographic funds to stockpile guns and ammo. She even wrote, quote, I'm not afraid of them, and also I am well armed. I don't even go to the john without my gun, and I have every intention to use it. Still, at this point, Diane's main focus was on the gorillas. In 1971, Bob was approached by a friendly male gorilla Diane had tracked since 1968. The gorilla was interested in Bob's glove, and the creature picked it up and smelled it. Soon enough, this gorilla visited Diane and Bob daily, preferring their company to the other gorillas, and he became Diane's favorite. She ended up naming this gorilla Digit because of his injured finger. Diane wrote, quote, He is a bright-eyed, inquisitive ball of fluff. He associates with none of the other gorillas in his group, and his mother seems to have died. It's her best friend. As Diane's relationship with the gorillas deepened, so did her relationship with Bob. One night, Diane scurried down to Bob's damp tent. <laughs> Tried to kiss him. Mm, nothing like a damn Bob's tent. married, so Bob was like, uh-uh, not into it, and shut it down. So Diane ran away, very embarrassed, but a few days later, he came to her cabin, and the two got it on. The next few years would become the absolute pinnacle highlight of her life. She spent the days studying the apes, playing around with them, especially with Digit, and at nights, she spent it with Bob. So here's some footage and audio from National Geographic lecture that Diane gave in 1973, and it features some of the film work done by Bob Campbell. We leave civilization behind us and go into the heartland of the mountains. It's so beautiful. It is. Such a unique experience, seriously. To build a nest may take up to five minutes. Carefully selected vines and stalks are bent in around the animal's body to make a good rim. The younger animals seem to have a bit of trouble with foliage that seems to have a mind of its own. Therefore, it has to be put in place bodily. They begin play nest at the age of two years, but sometimes their initial flimsy efforts need more practice. <laughs> so Diane really became infatuated with Bob, so much so that she nicknamed him Twinkle Toes. Big turnaround. First she's making him sleep on the outskirts of the camp. Now he's Twinkle Toes. Yeah. Sleeping right with her. Yeah. I just would love to know the origin story of the nickname Twinkle Toes. Me too. I know. How did, hmm. how did that happen? Interesting. And, you know, they, they really just fell head over heels. You know, Bob was the love of her life, but it was hard for her to admit that to Bob. One thing I never seem to have enough of is time. I've always struggled to find time to manage my finances, you know, with a busy schedule, a small child, a bunch of animals. The last thing I want to do at the end of the day is look at the budget, the expenses, and track down all of those pesky subscriptions and make sure I'm still using them and not just wasting money. Well, that all changed in the last year or so when I started using Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions and monitors your spending, and it helps lower your bills so that you can grow 
your savings. I'm a huge fan of Rocket Money. I actually pay for the premium version of the app because I love it so much. And it gives you some additional features like looking at your net worth, credit monitoring, among other things. It really just allows you to get a complete view of your personal finances all in one place and one app that has an absolutely amazing dashboard. It gives you a clear view over your subscriptions and your expenses. And what's even better is that Rocket Money will go and actually cancel those subscriptions for you with just a few taps, which saves you so much time and ultimately money. Rocket Money will even try to negotiate your bills lower for you by up to 20%. All you have to do is submit a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. And they'll even deal with the customer service for you. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions. I cut mine down in nearly half, saving its members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's features. I tell everybody I know about this app. I've gotten uh, some of the other employees here at Malhar Media to download the Rocket Money app because it really is the best personal finance app out there and it will save you money, which who doesn't want to save money these days? So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash milehigher. That's rocketmoney.com slash milehire. Check it out today. Let them know we sent you at rocketmoney.com slash milehire. As you can probably tell by this point, Diane had a pretty, pretty crazy life. And at one point somewhere along the way, she had two abortions and she never revealed this to Bob because she was worried that this would scare him away. But let's remember, Bob had a wife in Nairobi and he ended up leaving to go visit her. While home, Richard Leakey approached Bob and asked him to join him on an expedition, which would end his time with Diane. Bob was torn. He loved Diane, and he loved working with the gorillas, but he knew it was unsustainable. Wildlife photography was not his career, and more importantly, he wasn't going to leave his wife for Diane. After his trip home, he returned to Karasoki to tell Diane the news in person and finish up his work with the gorillas. However, Diane knew something was off. One day, while Bob was out with the gorillas, Diane went through his mail and discovered a letter from Richard Leakey that detailed their upcoming excavation. Diane was enraged. When Bob came back to camp, she gave him an ultimatum. Either stay in Karasoki with her and leave his wife, or never return. Bob ended up leaving Karasoki, and he never saw the gorillas again. Diane then wrote in her journal, quote, I'm not brave enough to say I haven't been hurt. It's no good gearing your life around someone when their life is obligated to someone else. I'm deeply sorry for him, only because he can't be true to himself. God, I hope someone comes up here soon. After this, Diane's work suffered, and she continued to smoke two packs a day of cigarettes and would drink one or two bottles of whiskey alone in her cabin. When she did leave her cabin, she would only spend time with Digit and his group. She named the other gorillas in the group after family members and people in her life like Uncle Bert and Aunt Flossie which I think this really says a lot about where her mind state's at at this point yeah. in her life. And mm -hmm. I mean, when you're drinking one or two bottles of whiskey a day yeah. and great. you're alone mm -hmm. and you're starting to name the gorillas after real people in your life. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, it's tough. It's just, yeah, I feel bad for her, honestly. I do too. It's in pretty sad. Yeah. Because it seemed like is, her life is sad. She just needed love. And she thought she had that love with Bob. But Bob, <laughs> he had love somewhere else. That's true, Josh. Good observation. So, yeah. Yeah. So, th this is the turn. I think this was a big turning point for Diane. I think after this, yeah, it's just I'd like. I'd say the turning point was a while back, but. Well, I think this was the worse. downward spiral mm -hmm. uh, for her, ultimately. Eventually, Diane decided to start inviting Western students to study under her. During this time, they were the ones who conducted most of the actual research. And still, Diane did not trust the locals to conduct this research. She only had one Rwandan student during her nearly two-decade-long research project, which says a whole lot, right? And he only joined in during the last year of her life. Ian Redmond, Diane's student, took up most of the day-to-day -day research while she focused her hatred and loneliness on the poachers. The two of them would remain close friends. This time was when Diane began torturing the locals, setting fire to their homes, and kidnapped a child. Whether payback or accident, Diane had lost someone that she loved, and she was definitely out for revenge. On December 31st, 1977, Ian Redman was brought by the trackers to the body of a gorilla. 
And this wasn't a normal situation as the body was not stuck in a trap. The vegetation surrounding the body had been completely flattened, indicating a massive fight. A poacher's dog was laying dead next to the gorilla. Ian went to examine the nose print and identify the gorilla, but it had been decapitated. So absolutely brutal, and the gorilla's hands and feet were cut off as well, but no meat was harvested. And this is when Ian realized that the gorilla was Digit, which, as we know, was Diane's favorite gorilla, who she pretty much considered to be family to her. It seemed to be a targeted attack, retribution for Diane's actions towards the locals. They had found her favorite gorilla and killed him. Ian and the trackers brought Digit's body back to Diane, and she broke down and cried when she saw him. She pet his body before they buried him behind her cabin. Diane wrote, quote, There are times when one cannot accept facts. I would rather die myself than to know what he went through when he died. Here's a clip of Diane seeing Digit's body for the first time and the words that she wrote in her diary. And over and over into the rest of her life. There are times when one cannot accept facts for fear of shattering one's being. I have tried not to allow myself to think of Digit's anguish, pain, and the total comprehension he must have suffered in knowing what humans were doing to him. From that moment on, I came to live within an insulated part of myself. Ian Redman said that Digit's death was, quote, the end of life at Karasoki as we knew it. The poachers, likely incentivized by Mr. Z and the Rwandan government, continued to enact retribution against Diane by targeting her gorillas. In the year following Digit's death, Uncle Bert, a silverback named Macho, and two other gorillas were found killed in the same manner that Digit had been. It can't be confirmed that they were sought out because of their connection to Diane, but all of the gorillas that were killed were in Digit's group. The gorillas disbanded, and Diane didn't see them together again. The poachers then told Diane that she was next. In retaliation, Diane started the Digit Fund, an active conservation effort to fight the poachers head on. She armed and trained her guards, some as young as 15, and had them hunt the poachers. For some years, her guards destroyed more than 2,000 traps and captured many poachers. Whenever one was captured, they were first taken to Diane and tortured. And while it can't be confirmed if Diane's troops had killed any of the poachers, She would have definitely approved if they did. Again, it's important to note that almost all these people were living under extreme circumstances and poaching was really the only way they could survive. When Diane captured a man that she claimed was the one who killed Digit, she tortured him, humiliated him, stole his sumu, and hid it in her cabin. Some say that they would meet again soon. But it wasn't just the poachers who wanted Diane out of Karasoki. Mr. Z saw Diane's active conservation guards as a small army. And since he used death squads himself to kill political rivals, he feared the power that she held in Ruin Gary. In 1980, it's safe to say that Diane had lost her mind. She spent almost no time with the gorillas and focused all her time on arming and training her guards. At the request of National Geographic and the Rwandan government, Diane left Karasoki in 1980 before she settled in Ithaca, New York. Her students watched over her research camp the following years. And she was a professor at Cornell when she began writing her book, Gorillas in the Mist, which was published in 1983. Now, this book is extremely popular. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It was a massive success, and Diane started appearing on late-night talk shows and editorials. Here's a clip of Diane talking about how gorillas were perceived by most people during an interview for Gorillas in the Mist. You noted in the book that the natives labeled you or nicknamed you the lady who lives in the forest without a man. Why did you, why did you undertake this research alone? Niramachabele is the word. It's a lovely word, isn't it? I, I had really no option. I couldn't find anyone who was willing to sit in the forest for 15 <laughs> years. So that was it. I noted a little bit earlier, uh, as Jane and I were talking, that, that when you say gorilla to most people, they think King Kong. Or, but they basically think of something ferocious. Is the reputation deserved? Not at all. In fact, King Kong really was quite a nice fellow. It's the Fay Ray that you're getting upset about. <laughs> but the gorillas are so gentle. They're shy but they're curious, and they will be aggressive only when they're coming to the defense of their own family, their own mates or offspring. Her book was even given a movie deal, and she met with producers over the next few years, but she still felt like she needed to return to Karasoki. 
Some of her old students, Amy Vetter and Bill Weber, had their own ideas about conservation. They believed that the only way to stop poaching and government encroachment into the national parks was to incentivize the locals to participate in its conservation. They set up an ecotourism project investing in the local towns to build hotels and restaurants for Western tourists. That way, even those who didn't work in the park could benefit from the wildlife within. Though still new, the project was a massive success, and poaching within the park decreased drastically in the years following. Diane would always attribute this to her active conservation methods, but the fact is that no gorillas were targeted in the years that she lived away from Karasoki. I think this was actually very effective, and it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, clearly it was, and her method was not. But in her mind, She can't make the connection. Like, you're gone. No no gorillas are being killed during that time because of what other people are doing. But she believes the extreme way is what's going to actually get it done. Yeah. And I think she really stuck in her mind at this point. Yeah. And I think her ego is kind of wrapped up in this gorilla lady. You know, I think she's now she's got the persona and the public perspective. Right. I, I think there's a lot of ego involved here. And from a like a logical standpoint it makes a ton of sense to if you bring more people here and you do it i mean think about every place where there's conservation happening mm-hmm. there is some type of tourism mm-hmm. involved with that not always done in the right way though yeah i agree but i think especially when it comes to poaching it seems like this is a a smart way to combat that because again a lot of the locals are doing it for monetary reasons and if you give them another way to make money then they don't need to go kill kill the animals does that stop it completely absolutely not but i think it does decrease it Mm -hmm. uh, dramatically versus this like vigilante justice like Mm -hmm. crazy woman in the forest but in her mind that is the only way and she she you know she doesn't give any credit to amy and bruce no because she's like overly protective. I mean, she's feels like she's one of the gorillas at this point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, like she's there, got anger her, behind it. Yeah, which to some degree I can understand. Not that it justifies anything that she did by any means, but I can see where that anger brewed from. You know, yeah, I she, see where she it... really did view these gorillas as family, and she she regarded animals to be just as important as humans. Which is fine, but. It seems like at some point she just became completely mad. Yeah. Oh, totally agree. <laughs> like, I'm just trying to kind of explain her, like, what got her mind to this place? How did she get so... Yeah, dead? her past experiences and experiencing the firsthand trauma of seeing gorillas killed. But to, you know, it's like, you know, the old saying, like, combating violence with violence. Is that is nope. that the way to go? Right. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Does that actually solve anything at the end of the day? Well, clearly, we have the facts right here. It wasn't working, and when she left and they tried something else, it actually helped. So that was, I think, that was a big hit to her ego, oh, realizing totally. that oh, maybe I'm not 100. I don't know if she right was here. able to, but I don't think she was able to necessarily that. like. Yeah, I think she's too too far too deep in the jungle at this point. Yeah, you could say that to get to get out. Diane even hated Amy and Bruce when they were with her, as she couldn't stand to be around couples after Bob left her. She'd only spoken to Bob once in 10 years since he left her, and she told him she needed to see him and that he should return to Karasoki. Bob declined because he had told his wife about Diane and they had just worked through it as a couple. When Diane wrote Gorillas in the Mist, she cut Bob entirely out of it. He wasn't even allowed to sell any photos or footage from his time at Karasoki, which is a bit petty, if you ask me. Which she did during that interview, too. You know, mm-hmm. the guy's like, you're alone. Yeah, woman doesn't mention name. anybody else that yeah. was ever out there mm-hmm. with her. Wouldn't they like to know about Bob in the damp tent? Yeah, exactly. It would add a lot to the story, but nope, it's all about her. Yep. With news about Amy and Bill's new venture, Diane was enraged. Not only did her racist belief say that no one and that wasn't on her staff could look after the gorillas, but she didn't want tourists intruding either. Probably because that also limits her, you know, impact from her perspective. In 1985, Diane returned to Karasoki, intent on stopping Bill and Amy and further militarizing her guards. So she's like, we're going to war. It's like, I'm going to get, we're just going to fight this out, which just, I don't know, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But also when you know that Diane was not in the best of health, she'd actually developed severe emphysema and could barely speak. 
The three-hour hike to Karasoki was taxing, and on her return, her drinking only got worse. In the last year of her life, Diane only visited the gorillas twice. All of the research was conducted by her American student, Wayne McGuire, whom she thought was stupid, and her only Rwandan student, Joseph Munyaneza, who started researching at Karasoki while Diane was away. Wayne was cordial with Diane, but knew she could no longer be at Karasoki. Not only was her physical health failing, but her mental health was failing too. An example of that was one day, Diane stalked one of Bill and Amy's tour groups through the park, and when the Dutch tourists got too close to the gorillas, Diane fired her pistol over their heads. At this point, the Rwandan government wanted Diane to leave immediately after this all went down. Amy and Bill's venture made good money for Rue and Gary, and they thought Diane was deranged at this point. They wanted her gone, and they wanted to turn Karasoki into a tourism center. The U.S. Embassy invited Diane to the capital city of Kigali to show a film to the Rwandan government and let her stay. The film impressed Rwandan officials, but they asked Diane why she was so harsh to the poachers. She said it was because the government didn't do anything to reprimand them. This response infuriated the government, but they knew they couldn't just get rid of her. The U.S. Embassy supported her, and many tourists came because she was still the beloved gorilla lady in the United States. If they learned that she'd been kicked out for protecting her gorillas, they might not want to support Rwanda with her money. Of course, the U.S. public didn't know about her methods, you know, of protecting the gorillas up to this point. Instead, they decided to make life difficult for Diane. They only issued her two-week visas, which would have to renew in the capital city, many miles away. So Diane would have to hike the three hours down the mountain, drive to the capital, renew her visa, and then go and repeat the process two weeks later. This process alone nearly killed her. But then, during a 50th anniversary celebration for Rwanda's tourist office, President Juvenal Habyarimana wanted to meet with Diane. He expressed gratitude for her work, highlighting the importance of Rwanda's wildlife. She told him about her visa situation that it was becoming too much to bear. He invited her once more to Kigali, and once there, he issued her a two-year visa to complete her research. Diane was elated. She finally felt supported once more in her endeavor. When she made the hike up the mountain to Karasoki for the last time, on December 7th, 1985, she coughed up blood the entire way and then got drunk. Everyone knew of the president's newfound support for Diane, including the poacher she tortured and Mr. Z, the brother-in-law to the president and leader of Ruangari. Every year, Diane held a Christmas party for her staff and gave presents to her trackers and their families. It was the one time a year she gave back to the people who lived around her. But she had to postpone it this year because Hollywood producers were coming to Karasoki to discuss the film adaptation of Gorillas in the Mist. She had told everyone that she would reveal something very important to the producers once they arrived. She also wrote a letter to Ian Redman, her old student and friend, that never made it to him. At one point in mid-December, Diane got into an argument with her best Rwandan tracker, Relicana. In an outburst, she fired Relicana, and he returned to his home beneath the mountain. However, this had happened many times before, and he knew to return in a few days like nothing ever happened. On the night of December 26, Wayne was in his tent reviewing notes from earlier in the day. Joseph was back home with the family, and Diane was in the cabin with her tracker, Nemeye, as they wrapped presents together. At around 9 p.m., Diane sent Nemeye to his tent. She got drunk and went to sleep. Her final journal entry reads as follows. When you realize the value of all life, you dwell less on what is past and concentrate on the preservation of the future. At around 6 a.m. on December 27, 1985, trackers woke Wayne from his tent while they said, Diane Khufu, meaning Diane is dead. Wayne entered the cabin to find Diane's belongings everywhere, strewn about like someone was looking for something. He then found Diane's body lying face up. Her face had been hacked down the middle by a machete, and he said that her skull looked like broken glass. So brutal. Whew. On the floor next to her was a machete and her pistol, though the magazine was next to it, and it was loaded with the wrong ammo. That's when they noticed a small hole had been expertly cut from the corrugated iron exterior of the cabin, yet no one had heard the loud metal-on-metal -metal noise that would have had to have been created if someone had cut it with a machete. In Diane's fists were two clumps of hair, and witnesses say that it belonged to a white person, but couldn't positively say if it was Diane's. She could have pulled it out while she was attacked, or she could have pulled it from the attacker. Regardless, the hair was collected by the American consulate. She was known as a lonely woman who treated the gorillas of Rwanda with love and tenderness. But Diane Fossey had very little use for people. And in the 18 years she spent in Africa, Fossey made a number of enemies. Now, obviously, this is a very brutal way to die. And I'm curious what you think. Do you think that someone like Diane 
do you think she deserved it? Do you think she had it coming? Well, I think if you look at everything that's happened, fate was going to, it was going to catch up to her at some point. You know, I think there's a lot of people that she pissed off over the years. Mm -hmm. She pissed off the Rwandan government. She pissed off the locals. She's literally chasing people around in a Halloween mask. Setting people's homes on fire. Setting people's homes on fires. Wildly racist. Yeah. Torturing. Well, and getting like, enjoyment out of it, spreading misinformation about their culture. Yeah, and there's probably people that believe she was this an actual witch living in the jungle. Like and that's what she wanted. Doing, you know, black magic rituals and cursing people. So I'm sure there is plenty of people that wouldn't be upset to see her yeah you know no longer around so it's hard because she did do a lot of good like you can't ignore that and i don't know i i I really am like how much good like what does good mean i mean she brought tons of awareness and but somebody else could have brought that awareness without all this other shit i feel like i completely agree i'm not justifying anything that she did i i think you know, I think there's far more bad than good here with her. Mm-hmm. And that might be a hot take, but I really think that she may have delayed conservation from happening yeah, I at can a see faster that rate too. because she was this crazy lady in, in on the mountain that's like gunning people down and trapping people. Like, she's scary. Well, I think it depends on how you see it, though, because there are people out there who do see animals as equals, especially animals as intelligent as gorillas. Um, So, you know, when you see it from that perspective, like if she was protecting a group of people, would you look at it differently? Right. But there's proper extremes. There's proper channels to do that in. Right. Like there's a reason there's park rangers and. You know, and I get like the Rwandan government's clearly complicit with, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. poaching and stuff like that. I think it's one of those situations that there's no good answer to, right? There's not Mm -hmm. a, there's not really an ideal, perfect solution to this issue. So, and that's what she felt was like, well, if nobody's going to do anything about that, they're just going to slap the wrist of these poachers and they're just going to keep doing it. Then the only way to do it is to protect them with force and, which I get to some extent, but at the same time, she took it 10 steps further yeah. and also blocked other people out f- who wanted to go and study the gorillas and mm-hmm. help with conservation. So yeah. yep. to me, I I kind of feel like she did more harm than good, ultimately. And do you think she, I mean, in my opinion, I think she knew that this likely would be probably the way that her life ended. I mean, I guess she was so ill that maybe she thought she would die of natural causes eventually, but. I think she knew what she was getting herself into and that this eventually could be the. the Yeah, I I think she I mean, if she's carrying a gun to the toilet, like I think she knew that her life is in danger at any point in time. So. But it is brutal. Machete. Well, machetes are like the weapon um, in this region of the Mm -hmm. world, you know, that the average person has access to. Terrible way to die. I know we were watching a documentary on Diane and can't remember who exactly was talking about it, but just how she probably felt a lot of pain in the end. You know, like in my mind, I thought with a blow like that, you would die pretty instantly. But I guess they were they were saying that she probably really experienced a terrible. end. Yeah, it was it was 100 percent a brutal, horrible, painful death for sure. And it seems like because she had hair, hair in her hand, I think that indicates that there was some type of struggle. There's no, stuff strewn sure. all about. She tried to fight. It is interesting, though, that nobody heard mm-hmm. this this attack going on. Yeah. And then a hole being cut out of metal, like, that's all very weird and sketchy to me. So, yeah. Well, as as we'll see here in a minute, like, it really makes you start wondering, like, who did this? Yeah. Who actually carried this attack out? Plenty of options because plenty of people hated Diane. Right, right. But anyway, Diane was buried five days later next to Digit, Uncle Bert, and Macho, and some other poached gorillas as well. She was buried on the anniversary of Digit's death. Rosamond Carr, the woman who first befriended Diane in Rwanda, said that she was the only person at the funeral who loved her. She had made many enemies. Diane's trackers had noticed two sets of bare footprints leading to her cabin. 
They pointed it out to the Rwandan authorities, but they didn't seem to make note of it. The trackers surmised that it must have been a Rwandan who left the prints since white people in the camp could not walk barefoot. The hole cut into the cabin still perplexed everyone. As, you know, as Josh said, how could no one hear this hole getting cut? Some people believe that the murderers cut the hole from the inside of the cabin after killing Diane, potentially softening the noise. Well, going back to what you're saying about how she died and dying by a machete, Mm -hmm. I think it's very clear, unless there is some other type of tool involved with cutting the, you know, the wall of the cabin, I think that tells you that these machetes are extremely sharp. I mean, to be able to cut through a piece of metal like yeah. that, like you're, the blade's got to be pretty damn sharp. So, um, I mean, it, the, in, the injury she that sustained. That's what it no, we is. don't. We don't know, but I, I think it's you know just kind of looking at everything as a whole. I think it seems like most likely it was a machete. I mean, it's not like there have been power tools out there, right? Right. Probably not. Yeah. So. Well, when Ian Redmond returned in January to assess the camp and Diane's belongings, he found something very interesting. For one, he ruled out robbery because there were thousands of dollars in cash and jewelry just left in the destroyed cabin. Then he discovered the sumu that Diane had stolen from the poacher she accused of killing Digit hidden in an envelope within her dresser. Then he found the most interesting piece of evidence yet. Hidden in the same dresser was a carbon copy of a letter addressed to him. Diane knew that the government had gone through her mail, and since Ian never received this letter, he suspected it was destroyed en route. And it detailed a smuggling operation between Congo and Rwanda, where wealthy poachers and traffickers used the Varunga National Park to illegally transport gold to government officials. Mm. Could this have been the information that Diane would reveal to those Hollywood producers? Probably. Moreover, Ian Redmond believed with the additional information, Mr. Z was the benefactor of this gold smuggling operation. Mr. Z operated with impunity throughout Ruin Gary as he sent death squads to get rid of political rivals. Though Mr. Z would leave Rwanda in 1989, his same death squads were integrated into some of the Hutu militia that perpetrated the Rwandan genocide in 1994. Their weapon of choice was always a machete. However, some Rwandan trackers believed that the murder was carried out in a way that did not indicate Rwandans did it. They thought that it was the Congolese poachers that Diane had tortured or even the man that she had accused of killing Digit. Some even believed that it was the Congolese soldiers that she had tricked 14 years earlier who got the revenge for having been arrested. This one was a stretch, as Diane and Karasoki were famous, but that would mean that the soldiers had waited over a decade. But if they had been in prison for that time, it could make sense that they found Diane after their eventual release. And of course, the hit didn't have to be carried out by professionals. Diane could barely see, which is why her gun was unloaded with the magazine next to it, and she had grabbed the wrong ammo. On top of that, she could barely even speak due to her emphysema, so it would have been impossible for her to scream. But of course, the Rwandans had to investigate the death, and it was led by none other than Mr. Z. Rwandan police arrested every tracker and guard at Karasoki over the age of 15. Many were tortured, some were released, and many were never seen again. After Ian Redmond left, Wayne McGuire was the sole American researcher who looked after the camp. Rwandan police were in and out for many days, and they roped off Diane's cabin for entry. Wayne thought he saw someone inside Diane's cabin one day, so he investigated. The trackers left in the camp didn't see anyone inside before Wayne. Wayne said that he investigated the cabin and he found a lock of his hair stored in an envelope in Diane's dresser. This was very strange, and he remembered that Diane had asked him for his hair many months ago. At this point, the witchcraft Diane participated in was no act. She definitely believed it. Then the Rwandan guards approached the cabin. The tracker said that Wayne carried a box of Diane's notes and manuscripts. Wayne denied this. Regardless, he was caught in an off-limit zone and arrested. At the Rwandan police station, investigators questioned Wayne for many hours. They accused him of killing Diane to steal her research. This would be unlikely, as Diane didn't do any research in the last year of her life, and the only documents of value were the sequel to Gorillas in the Mist. They informed Wayne that they had captured Relicana, Diane's best tracker, who she had fired and wasn't even in the camp at the time of her murder. They claimed that Wayne and Relicana worked together to kill Diane. Wayne claimed that he had never met Relicana in his life. 
This is unlikely, as they had worked together in the same camp for many months. But working together to commit a murder was ridiculous, as they didn't even speak the same language. The police questioned and intimidated Wayne until they forced him to sign a piece of paper, which he imagined was a confession, though he didn't know for sure. He was then allowed to return to Karasoki. A few months later, Relicana was dead in prison. Government officials claimed it was suicide, though prison guards said that they had seen a militia enter a cell and walk out with his body wrapped in a bag. He would have no means to have killed himself while in prison, but of course, there was still hair found clenched in Diane's fists. The Rwandans sent their sample to a lab in Paris while the U.S. sent theirs to the FBI. The FBI sample was inconclusive, but the Paris sample indicated that the hair belonged to a white person other than Diane. And that was all that the Rwandans needed. So they went forward and charged Wayne McGuire with the murder of Diane Fossey and sought the death penalty. The U.S. Embassy thought this was absurd and worked quickly to extradite Wayne to the U.S. After a dramatic sequence of events, Wayne was safely brought to California. Wayne's trial went forward in Rwanda without him present, and proceedings lasted just one hour. Wayne had no defense, and he was given the death penalty in absentia. While Rwandans felt that they put the case behind them, no one truly knows who killed Diane Fossey. Research at Karasoki continued, though now it became a tourist center that Diane detested all that time. In 1994, President Juvenal Habyarimana's plane was shot down, supposedly by rebel Tutsi forces. This sparked his Hutu militias to enact revenge and kickstart the Rwandan genocide, and in just one month, over 800,000 people were killed. The original Karasoki research camp was utterly destroyed, and only pieces of Diane's cabin were left. Mr. Z ended up being tried in the early 2000s for crimes against humanity and instigating the genocide. American prosecutors hoped they could include Diane's murder in the investigation. The UN sentenced Mr. Z to 20 years in prison for crimes against humanity, but a UN appeals court had him released in 2009 saying that serious errors have been made in his trial, and Mr. Z is likely still alive today. Wayne McGuire returned to the U.S. but could never work in primatology again. He bounced around from job to job, always getting fired when his employer learned of his implication in Diane's murder. He was actually homeless for a while, but eventually found his footing working in mental health, and he is still alive today as well. Though the original Karasoki research camp is destroyed, its work lives on. Felix Nadijimana is the current overseer of Rwanda's operations and is the first native Rwandan to lead the camp. Ecotourism, though complicated, has benefited the Rwandans and the mountain gorillas. The locals do not engage in poaching on the Rwandan side, and the mountain gorillas' population has reached between 800 and 1,000 and it has actually been removed from the list of critically endangered species. However, things are not the same in the Congo. More and more, the park has been sold to foreign mining operations, displacing locals and the gorillas. And on top of that, a civil war has been raging since 1996 in the Congo, egged on by Rwandan militias looking for revenge for Congo's role in the 1994 genocide. Fighting has taken place in the Virunga National Park, and nearly 6 million people have been killed across the country. Many have been forced to relocate to Rwanda or Uganda, and on the Ugandan side of the park, poaching for survival is very much still a way of life. And Diane's murder is still unsolved. The court building in Kigali was destroyed during the genocide, and all of the evidence and documents from her case are gone. The hair sample sent to Paris has been destroyed, and the FBI sample is, of course, missing now. Diane's legacy is complicated. She certainly was a horrible racist who put the lives of gorillas over the lives of locals. Her methods are considered barbaric by today's standards, and she was ultimately wrong in the role ecotourism could play in conservation. Still without Diane's work, the Western world would know little about the mountain gorilla. She inspired many people, Westerners, and Rwandans alike to take part in preserving the species. This is how Diane described her first encounter with the gorillas many years before her mysterious murder. She said, I shall never forget my first encounter with gorillas. Sound preceded sight. Odor preceded sound in the form of an overwhelming musky barnyard human-like scent. The air was suddenly rent by a high-pitched series of screams followed by the rhythmic rondo of sharp poke-poke chest beats from a great silver-backed male. I don't think we'll ever know who killed Diane Fossey, unfortunately. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think Mr. Z seems like the likely suspect. Yeah, I agree. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it seems very clear that he was involved with killing lots of people, and it would have been probably very easy for him to have her killed. And it, it does seem, I mean, if what Wayne is saying is true, and he, you know, he says he's not, he's innocent, he didn't do anything. Which I've watched interviews with him, and I definitely, I believe him. I feel really bad for him. Like, yeah. the way that this all went down was, like, very, I don't know. The hole in the side of the cabin is, like, is interesting. It's, like, that's a, it's, like, 
an extra step somebody has to take, you know, yeah. and to cut that out just big enough for somebody to crawl through and, um, and nothing was stolen. Yeah. Um, initially, I don't know. I, I, I think it was probably Mr. Z's death squad or something like that. Or Mm -hmm. I guess it could have been poachers getting back at her, but I mean that the poachers had all these years prior to, to, you know, carry this out. So it's, I think the timing of it kind of lines up more with Mr. Z I and agree. I agree. the ecotourism starting to take off. And but who also, really knows? I mean, she had so many enemies. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't think you can really settle on just one. I think there's so many possibilities. But yeah, she's she's somebody who I don't know how you how you really feel about her at the end of the day. I don't know. I I personally am just I'm like. I don't think anybody deserves to be murdered, right? I mean, she was already very, very sick and clearly at the end of her life as as it was. But uh, I I really don't like most of the things that she did. I feel like she did very little good at the end of the day. Compared to the, the bad, yeah. Because it seems like the, the ecotourism, as far as we know, like I don't know all the specifics and how effective it actually is but based on what we do know from this seemed like that was a very effective way of protecting the gorillas and maybe had been would have been far more effective had it been employed earlier yeah and if she wasn't diane had been there. like i don't yeah. see why diane couldn't have been a part of that and led that and embraced it i think her experience would have been far better with everybody around her but it just seems like she got so wrapped up in being the gorilla lady and mm-hmm. it was in my her way mind. or the highway. Yeah. You know? Like yeah. I have all the answers and yeah. Well, and just like her, she could not have been thinking clearly like most of the time. I mean, she's drinking all day. Yeah. She's out alone, mm-hmm. isolated. She can't really talk to anybody around her because they don't understand English completely. I mean, mm-hmm. other than when Wayne Wayne shows up, and even then, it doesn't seem like she really cared that much about him. So it's it interesting kind of though, like a, looking like back at the beginning of this episode too, her childhood and just how abused she was by her stepfather and controlled, and and it's interesting. All of that really shapes you so much. You yeah, know, you the at, alcoholism too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, all of it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely curious to hear people's thoughts in the comments. Do you think Diane did more good or more bad? Yeah, pretty simple. Yeah. But that's where we're going to leave you today. Yep. We'll see you guys next time. And until then. Keep on taking your mind a mile higher. Higher.